Welcome to the Athlete's First Performance Podcast, where two performance-minded physical therapists break down the evidence to improve overall health, movement, and performance for athletes and active individuals. All right, welcome to episode 16 of the Athlete's First Performance Podcast, and today we're going to be talking about the brand new uh, hamstring strain injury and in athletes clinical practice guideline from JOSPT. Um, it just came out ahead of print and it should be in the March uh, next month's um, uh, magazine. So uh, James, you want to give us a rundown of what we're going to be talking about today? Yeah. So today we're pretty much going to go right through the CPG and go through different parts of each section and kind of talk about what interested us and what, uh, how we can apply that best in practice. So it's going to start with the scope of the CPG, uh, the pathoanatomy, some of the incidence rates, mechanism of injury, different risk factors, treatment interventions, and then how can we prevent these overall in our athletes? Um, so we can first start off of the scope of the CPG. So this is very sports related. So the CPG includes the sports related overloading and overstretching injuries to the hamstrings. And it's not going to focus on any type of um, hamstring tendinopathy or anything in that nature. And only studies that directly assess the time to return to play and re-injury rates were included in this CPG. So very focused, very specific to hamstring strains in athletes. So next, let's talk a little bit about the pathoanatomical features. So um, in the research, it shows that the long head of the biceps femoris muscle is the most commonly involved hamstring muscle in both first time and recurrent injuries. And it's pretty uh, highly relevant in terms of percentage wise. So 79 to 84% of the all hamstring injuries involve the biceps femoris. And it occurs mostly in the proximal biceps femoris at the musculotendinous junction. Um, and some of the reasons why the hamstrings are likely to be injured is because the hamstrings have a higher percentage of these type two muscle fires. So more of the fast and powerful muscles, um, as well as possible the anterior pelvic tilt that we see in a lot of athletes. So it already puts the hamstrings in a pre-stretched position in a more lengthened position that can potentially increase the likelihood of hamstring strain injury. Yeah, I'll go into the incidence of things. So typically you're going to see um, these injuries in uh, like track and field athletes, soccer players, um, Australian rules football, so in American football. So typically um, sports that have more of a uh, quick change of pace and, and, and a, um, a higher velocity of movement. Um, in general, hamstring strain injuries will – uh, typically they'll cause a significant loss of time from competition. Um, and obviously it depends on the grade, which we'll go into later, but it can be, you know, with a grade one, anywhere from like three up to 20 days, 28 days, or even more. Um, this depends on the injury severity, uh, re-injury rates are, um, quite high and we can talk about different, uh, modifiable and unmodifiable factors that could play a role, but in general, um, the re-injury rate could be between 13.9 and 63.3%. Um, and that's primarily looked at in Australian rules football and track and field athletes. Um, one of the big things to predict uh, re-injury um, would be a history of hamstring injury. Those that have a history of hamstring injuries, uh, they'll have a 3.6 time higher risk of sustaining a future injury. And they also mentioned that um, – uh, obviously the, the more, and this makes sense, but the more recent, the injury, the higher likelihood of re-injury, um, and, and saying that players or athletes that had an injury, um, within the same season are high, more likely to re-injure it as opposed to someone who had an injury, uh, the season before, um, to, you know, the current season. Yeah. And I think that's why this paper is so important. It just highlights the fact that, um, once you do get that hamstring strain injury, us as rehab professionals, we're not doing a good enough job, which is why these uh, re-injury rates are so high. So I think going through this paper and going through some of the papers that they cited in this CPG is definitely important in helping us better manage these athletes that have these uh, hamstring injuries. Yeah, I think, um, and I think one of the other things too, at least with the um, like the, the time from injury is just you, your, your rehab's not necessarily going to, you can't affect that. It's just time. So just keeping in mind and maybe just giving the athlete uh, a little bit of an expectation of how long it could take um, may be helpful. It's in the general 
um, rehab timeline, at least to, to, so they're not expecting they're going to come back a week later. Um, uh, so I think the time piece is important and obviously something you can't change. Um, do you want to go ahead and talk about mechanism of injury and how these things typically happen? Yeah. So there's two main mechanism of injuries. And the first one is more like an overloading type injury, which occurs um, mostly during running and sprinting. So the hamstrings are put in a length of position during high speed running. And the hamstrings job is to essentially contract um, across the hip and the knee during the late swing phase to slow down the lower leg. And this injury typically involves the bicep femoris and the surrounding tissue. So if you think about a sprinting action as that leg swinging forward, the hamstrings have to essentially contract and slow down the lower leg, uh, which puts the hamstrings on more of that stretch position and um, most likely injures that bicep femoris. And then the second main mechanism of injury is more of a, a kicking type injury. So with the leg straight and hip flexion and extension, and that typically involves a proximal semimembranosus tendon. Um, and some things to note about that initially that overstretching injury might not be as painful, but because it's involving the tendon, we know that tendons don't have as much blood flow and those can typically take a little bit longer than the musculotendinous junction of that biceps morris long head. So let's move into some of the non-modifiable risk factors. Um, Of course, these are important to know, but it's not something that we can change directly with these athletes. Um, So like we talked about before, um, there's two to six times higher rate of recurrence following previous hamstring injury. So once they're injured, there's very likely to be injured again. So we definitely need to know that. And kind of like you were saying earlier, Josh, um, having a recent hamstring injury within the past eight weeks was found to put individuals at a greater risk for injury when compared to those with a injury, maybe one or two years ago. So managing those acute in-season hamstring injuries, definitely have to be careful about returning them too early and monitoring them through the rest of the season. Um, of course, this is um, pretty common in terms of most injuries, but a history of like a previous ACL injury, a calf strain, as well as other knee injuries and ankle ligament sprains are to be a known risk factor for a hamstring injury. So making sure that we have to note that when you were rehabbing um, athletes from other injuries, making sure that we're hitting the hamstrings, making sure that we're gradually introducing them to high-speed running. And then the last one, which I thought was pretty interesting, um, athletes older than 23 years of age were at greater risk for those than people that were younger than 23. So it might be age. It might be as we get older, we're not involved in as much high-speed running, but just something to make note of. Yeah, I think it's interesting because if I remember correctly, is um, uh, as you get older, you, you you lose your your type two muscle for your quick twitch muscle fibers to kind of move into uh, more type one muscle fibers, and because type two muscle fibers, at least with the hamstrings, seem to be um, related to a higher incidence um, of of a muscle strain or a tendon issue, um, the fact that as you get older. Um, changing or increasing the risk of a strain, um, kind of goes against that. But on the other hand, I would, you know, imagine the, and we'll talk about this, um, uh, that the stiffness within the muscle or the fascicle link within the muscle changes, um, in a, a negative way that could cause, you know, higher, higher likelihood of a strain. Yeah, for sure. So do you want to hit the modifiable risk factors? Yeah. Uh, these were interesting because there's a couple of things that, um, that I think maybe some of the traditional treatments for, for a hamstring strain, um, can, can go against what they would typically say as a risk factor for possible injury. So, uh, one thing just to note was that, um, there's no support for weight or body mass and body mass index as a risk factor, um, for hamstring injuries. Um, but, uh, what I think this was interesting, I don't know if, if you, uh, thought the same, but, there's uh, from systematic reviews and meta analyses, there's no relationship between a hamstring flexibility and hamstring injury, um, which I, I think would, I don't know, to me in my head, that would make, it would make sense that there is a relationship. Um, but on the other end, which was something that we kind of talked about before we started recording was um, there are some studies that say the bicep femoris fascicle length and the hamstring muscle tendon unit stiffness are related to hamstring injuries. So trying to determine the difference between flexibility and, and muscle stiffness or short uh, shortness was, 
I, I couldn't really make the connection. And I tried to follow the sources that, that um, uh, made that claim. Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, I guess it's still your, I mean, would the treatment be the same? You're just, I mean, technically a flexibility is not an issue. You may not need to stretch, but you definitely want to have the kind of the freedom of movement to handle those high eccentric forces when you're sprinting. Right. So I would think that flexibility would of some, maybe just general like muscle pliability would play a role. Yeah, for sure. I think if we break down flexibility and mobility and range of motion, like flexibility, they might be calling that as more like the passive range of motion. So say someone's like a yogi, they've got great passive range of motion, but they don't have strength at those end ranges. Maybe that's what they're they're referring to. So if they have, if they're super flexible, but they're not strong at those end ranges, that might not play a factor in um, preventing any type of hamstring injury. So having good, strong end range of motion and range control and strength in the hamstrings in that length of position, if they change it to better hamstring mobility or a better hamstring strength at end range, that might be something to consider versus just the flexibility of being a, not a risk factor. Yeah. Yeah. I think that makes sense. It's, it's more like you can get into the weeds of that stuff, or it's more like, are you, are you going to be like, how are you going to treat that? But, um, I think the general, and we get into this later, but the general treatment, as far as exercise goes, would, would cover that stiffness, um, or fascicle length issue as far as the risk factor for hamstring injuries. Um, a couple other, uh, modifiable risk factors just under muscle performance. Um, Another thing that I thought was interesting, there's limited evidence for hamstring weakness being a risk factor for hamstring injury. Um, I I think that's, it depends how you test it, but I believe they tested it with a handheld dynamometer. Um, uh, So I I think at at a specific isolated position, checking hamstring strength probably isn't very applicable to the actual mechanism of injury. Um, I would imagine like an eccentric strength test would be um, uh, more applicable. Uh, the, another interesting thing was the, they, one of the meta-analyses um, identified increased peak quadriceps torque as a risk factor, which in my head made sense because if you're talking about um, that late swing phase um, or just general having increased knee extensor torque, your hamstring is going to have to slow down more, um, more torque than, than if someone had uh, lower quadriceps torque, which would I would imagine increased strain on the hamstring muscle or tendon. Um, there, there was though conflicting results, um, in regards to hamstring to quad strength and balances as a risk factor. So I feel like that's kind of, um, that's, that's not a very clear, clear, um, identification of a risk factor in regards to quad hamstring strength. Um, the next, the next thing would be performance characteristics. So, um, those that increased positional high speed running demands, um, were a risk factor for hamstring injury. So I, I, I kind of think of like a hundred meter dash, um, 200 meter dash, um, uh, athlete, they're going to be, they're obviously going to be exposed to higher speed running demands, which would increase their, um, their risk factor. It's modifiable. And now you could probably say like change positions, but that's not, I don't think realistic for, um, most high level athletes, right. They're competing in the position or the, the, um, event that they are best at. So, um, that's when, uh, the, the treatment and working on prevention of re-injury or injury in general become more important. Um, some things, and you talked about this earlier was, uh, increased anterior pelvic tilt, um, and thoracic spine side bending during the backswing would be associated with hamstring injury. It was lower level studies, but in general, an anterior pelvic tilt just anatomically could put the hamstring in a little bit more of a lengthened position. Um, which would eventually increase more strain uh, during the during the backswing, and um, I would say the the late um, uh, swing phase as well. Um, the primary thing too uh, that was interesting. So, um, a variety of sports found that workload um, with time spent in games versus practice, as well as frequency of off season running, were not risk factors of hamstring injury. So the 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 thought process of like acute versus chronic workload doesn't necessarily play a role in these injuries. And I would imagine that's primarily because it's, uh, and I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, but primarily because a hamstring strain is going to be something that's like an acute quick injury. It's not going to be necessarily something that's chronic over time, particularly when they're saying that hamstring weakness, um, 
and you could think of that in the sense of fatigue over a chronic or a long period of time is not associated with a hamstring injury. But what do you think is, I mean, is that surprising to you? Yeah, I mean, it definitely is. I mean, I think the biggest thing is making sure that athletes are exposed to at least some type of high speed running. So if they've been exposed to high speed running throughout the season, they might not have that specific strain on the hamstring. So, but it did say athletes with rapid increases in high speed running exposure may be at risk. So does that conflict with that? Uh, I don't necessarily, cause that's just straight. So if we're, if we're considering a hamstring injury and this is just like my thoughts anyway, a almost somehow, you know, injuries are sometimes just bad luck. Yeah. I feel like a hamstring injury could sort of be just bad luck and that if chronic workload doesn't play a role, if flexibility doesn't really play a role and weakness doesn't play a role at that point, it's like, it seems part of it is just like, a, an accumulation of factors is what created the issue. And um, so I would almost, I would like just call that like an acute injury. So I could mm-hmm. see if you have an increased exposure, at least in the short term to high speed running over what you're doing, that would be like above the envelope of function of the hamstring muscle. But it, just like you said, like maybe like a chronic workload would be almost protective. So um, you would maybe you know, with the, an increased acute, uh, an acute increase in workload could just be challenging the tendon eccentrically beyond what it's used to, which may be why it's almost reverse um, for this injury, as opposed to like, like patellofemoral pain or something like that. Yeah. And I think, I don't know if there's any um, research on this, but in terms of like football, so either in early in spring ball or early in camp, you see a lot of those high, high speed running, increases and a lot more hamstring strains pop up during that time versus later in the year when they've been exposed to that over time and building up to that. So just hard to tell. That kind of makes sense. I'm wondering too, like just in the, in the, you know, if we talk about football, like early in the season, if you're seeing more of those hamstring strains than, than not, but I mean, I, I, I look back to um, whatever the Olympics was that Usain Bolt was his last Olympics. He pulled a hammy, I believe, and I could be wrong on that, but like on his very, like, you know, his very last race, it's not like he hadn't been training for that and he's the greatest sprinter ever. So sometimes it's just bad, I don't know, bad luck. Um, what about performance measures? Do you, are they, do you think they're, they're worth doing as far as um, looking at risk factors for these injuries? Yeah. So in the papers, it said that there was low levels of evidence for predicting hamstring injuries with like a single leg hop for distance and then using something like a force plate to uh, measure jumping percentage difference with the non counter movement versus counter movement jump. Um, I know a lot of high performance programs use like a counter movement jump to test readiness and um, a whole bunch of other factors, but I'd be more inclined to use that as more of like return to play and assess single leg power and things like that. Um, I don't know if I would be able to, I don't have the experience using them, but like predict a hamstring injury using like a counter movement versus non counter movement jump. So I think they'd be super valuable during the reconditioning and the rehab process to assess where they are during the rehab versus what they were in the preseason when they're healthy. But I don't know if it's worth doing that as like a, risk factor type of like pre-screen or pre-injury type risk factor. I think that's kind of common in um, a lot of screening activities for um, prevention. I mean, as far as like for prevention of injuries, again, it's kind of hard to, to put the person in a particular box and test whether an injury could be more likely to happen or not when there's a lot of other factors involved. Um, but I, yeah, part of the equation would definitely be, I would think would be some sort of like a good idea. Yeah, for sure. I, I know our team, we're looking at getting a uh, force plate and we're going to be using some type of counter movement or non counter movement jump as like a screen to assess. But mostly if they get hurt, we can reassess them and see where they are healthy versus rehab status. So I think it's valuable. Uh, one thing I did want to talk to you about, um, they talked about altered trunk control and glute muscle activity uh, to be a potential risk factor for hamstring injury. I know something that I've seen um, through like fellowship training was like a prone hip extension test and kind of palpating the glute, palpating the hamstring to see which one contracts first. So if they're more 
hamstring dominant during that prone hip extension, the hamstrings will contract first versus the glutes and vice versa if they're more glute dominant versus hamstring dominant. So if the glutes technically aren't firing before the hamstrings, the hamstrings might be doing more of the work and getting strained with that hip extension. So that's just yeah, that something that sense. I've seen in practice. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess uh, we didn't see anything on here necessarily. They, they talked about quad to hamstring ratio, but I don't think they said anything about glute to hamstring ratio. So um, that makes sense that I'd play a role uh, anatomically. Yeah, definitely hard to measure though. Yeah, so I would I would imagine it's sort of uh sort of I mean you can test strength in one versus the other, but timing is gonna be harder to measure unless you have like a EEG or something. Yeah, for sure. Um so do you, I can go into the the types of strains um if you're good to move into that process. Yeah. Let's go. Okay. Um so there's the they listed three different types of grade one, grade two, grade three. Grain what grade one being a mild strain, then moderate strain and severe strain. Um, so just uh, to give you some of the what they would consider criteria for a grade one strain, um, some micro tearing, which to us as a PT isn't necessarily going to you're not going to image these guys, so you can just assume micro tearing. Um, I wouldn't necessarily tell them they have tearing of their muscles because they may not that may change their outlook on things, but um, local pain, not widespread, probably point tenderness to, to a small, um, area. Um, you may see tightness or cramping in the posterior thigh, um, some pain with muscle stretching or activation. Um, you may notice that kind of like tendon injury stiffness that they may feel would subside during activity, but would come back after activity. Um, you're not going to see much strength loss and they use the, um, uh, the, the knee, the active knee extension, uh, test. Um, and we can talk about that during exam to measure, um, uh, basically deficit and hamstring stiffness or flexibility, or at least fascicle length. Um, so they're, they're saying that less than a 15 degree deficit of the, of that test. And I would assume that's comparing side to side. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, and then for grade two, moderate strain, um, again, they'll, they'll say, you know, moderate tear of muscle, muscle fibers, but the muscle is still intact, which would be the biggest thing. The muscle is still intact. Um, the pain area is going to be much uh, larger than, than the grade one strain, um, more pain, uh, stiffness, weakness, maybe bruising, uh, as well. Um, you're going to notice deficits with gait, um, particularly within the day, first day or two after the injury. And then you're gonna have a larger deficit with that active knee extension test. Um, and then grade three would be a complete tear. Um, uh, you may notice it, it like a, like a mass of muscle tissue at the tear site. Um, uh, you most likely see, uh, will see bruising, bleeding, swelling. Um, they may not even be able to walk or at least have extreme difficulty. And then a, a pretty, like a very large, um, deficit in the angle with the active knee extension, um, test. Yeah. And I think that's very helpful. Like I use the active knee extension test in pretty much every, um, patient that I see following a hamstring strain. Um, I think it's pretty valuable in terms of helping guide their expectations in terms of when they will be able to get back to full high speed running and things like that. And it's also a good measurement in terms of, okay, this is what you were at on your initial eval. You give them a few things to work on at home and then they come back a couple of days later and it's already a lot better. So, um, I think it's something that it's useful in terms of measuring throughout the, like the early stages of rehab and it helps set expectations properly. Do you want to go into your evaluation process? Yeah. So that's typically the first thing that I do. I mean, I see them walk in, um, and actually we do see a lot of hamstring injuries in, in our clinic. Typically the first thing I do is watch them walk in and a lot of times that they're limping or, um, grabbing their hamstring, they're not able to walk with a normal gait. And then Next, I'll go ahead and just test that active knee extension uh, range of motion. So getting their hip at 90 degrees and their knee at 90 degrees and just try to extend as far as they can and take that measurement side to side. Um, and then depending on the severity and Ill irritability, we'll be able to test some of like their actual hamstring strength with manual muscle testing. Um, I don't break out any of like the handheld dynamometers the first day, especially if they're pretty painful. Um, I might test their non-involved side, but probably not going to test their involved side first day. 
And then going ahead and mapping where, where their uh, most tender area is in the hamstring, there is some evidence to say like more proximal injuries are going to take longer than born distal injuries, just because again, we're getting more into that tendon area and uh, tendons take a little bit longer to heal due to that decreased blood flow. But measuring the distance between the ischial tuberosity and the point of max tenderness, along with the length of that tenderness along the hamstring can help again, um, determine when they're actually going to be able to return to play and the severity of that actual hamstring injury. Is there anything else that you would do like early on, like first or second visit? Uh, in regards to examination, no, I, yeah. I think, um, I mean, that's kind of what I do with really everything is I try to figure out what their irritability is. I try to find their deficits. Hamstring strain, I think of a lot of injuries in my mind, and you see them way more than me based on like your clientele, but um, it's kind of a, I don't know, fairly straightforward issue because i mean the subjective in, in the location of pain is going to tell you quite a bit um and then just knowing the differences between grade one and grade two grade three would imagine to be uh kind of obvious especially if there's like a palpable mass um but then yeah you just find you find what the irritability is and, and then go from there i think getting a good idea of knee extension uh, range of motion when you can not forcing that position because you don't want to further irritate them. And it's not something that you're really going to be too concerned with initially as far as treating anyway. Um, but other than that, yeah, pain levels, um, and, and just kind of figure out what they can do at baseline. Yeah. And I think the going into the paper, they did a really good job of stating and showing how you can assess um, hamstring strength in different ranges. So I think that's important as well. And next week, we're going to get a little bit more specific into our treatment with like a criterion based rehab program. Um, but going into that CPG, just testing at different ranges of motion. So like prone with the knee at 90 degrees of flexion. So assessing strength there, assessing strength at 15 degrees of knee extension and prone. So longer length, uh, muscle strength, and then long length, is supine with the knee and hip at 90 and kind of pressing down. So that's where more of like those force plates will come in. So you can assess the hamstring in different strengths as well as like a field-based test with a single leg bridge. Yeah. Well, I think that's, well, just to go back for a second. Um, and I guess I would neglect to say, but definitely something that I would do would be to test the test strength, but just test your ability in those different knee angles, um, at least like first day. Um, to, and then test like if they can figure if they can have a pain-free motion um whether that's with like a simple heel slide where you're using a strap not using a strap um to to get just to like help me nail down the the first um uh like the first exercise the first treatment that we would do um and a single leg bridge yeah that makes sense if they can do it um i sometimes it, it depends if they can do it then you yeah, had to go right into it <laughs> Oh yeah. Yeah. Usually I don't see them being able to do that the first day, but as they progress from early stages to mid stages of the re reconditioning program, rehab program, I do like that single leg bridge test to assess limb symmetry in terms of how many reps they can do on their non-involved versus involved side. So I think that's a really good test with very little equipment needed to be able to assess. Yeah. It's nice to have like a performance measure, um, there as well. Uh, so yeah, no, that's good. I think the evaluation process is, is in the beginning, you're like, you shouldn't ask, you don't need to rush things. Like it, it's something that, um, just getting, getting the initial baseline measurements and going from there could be helpful. Cause a lot of the times the measurements that you're doing, just going kind to of move right into treatment, like particularly the single leg bridge test. Um, I'll let you kind of take the intervention piece. You see a lot more of these than I do. So what do you, let's just, we can start with like, what are you doing day one, day two, uh, and not necessarily day one, day two of the injury, but maybe first visit, second visit early on, um, treatment, uh, whether it's exercise, I don't know if you would add any sort of manual therapy. I don't, I don't know if I would, at least not early on. Um, but what are you doing with these people? Yeah. So first day I'm generally trying to just get them to move into some nice, easy, pain-free motion. So it might look like a sciatic nerve, like slider or glider, whatever you whatever you call it. So supine with their hip, it flexed at 90 degrees and then just nice and easy extending their knee, um, getting some pain-free range of motion into the hamstrings. And then 
there's a lot of good protocols out there. Um, I think the first one that I've used and learned of was uh, Heiderscheidt's and JOSPT. Uh, I'm sure that was part of your OCS uh, study and part of my residency in SCS studying. So that's the one that I like using right off the bat. So um, starting with some nice, easy passive range of motion, getting into some uh, frontal panning movement. So just nice, easy things like getting them up with band walks, clamshells, lateral hip, um, and even a lot of core exercise because it's not going to put a lot of strain on the hamstrings. So like front planks, side planks, um, calf, if they're able to like heel raises. So just getting them moving early on is going to definitely set the stage for um, a stronger rehab. And in terms of getting into like manual therapy, the first day I'm not going to be scraping them or anything like that, especially if it just happened. Um, just let that area heal naturally. But later on, if they're still having like sharp grabby pain in the hamstrings, um, a week or two down the road, I'll throw some like either dry needles in there or do some like instrument assisted soft tissue work, nothing super aggressive, but just get some input into that area to loosen it up and allow them to exercise without getting that like sharp stabby type pain in the hamstrings. Yeah, that sounds appropriate. Just getting things moving. And, and I mean, I'll, I'll start with some like hamstring, um, activation, like isometrics, if it's not pain, I mean, whatever is not painful, I feel like that's what we're doing. Um, yeah. whether that's range of motion, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily do any sort of like pushing into like stiffness as far as range of motion goes, but definitely just having them move through whatever their pain free range of motion would be. Um, and then, uh, yeah, if you can address other things in the other muscles in the lower extremity glutes would be a primary one. Um, I think that would be, I think that's totally appropriate as well. Plus it just gives them the idea of, okay, I can move a little bit. I mean, especially I would imagine, you know, like lateral movements are going to be more comfortable than sagittal movements. So I think, um, yeah, addressing any sort of other, uh, uh, muscles that, that aren't painful and then whatever's, you know, pain through range of motion, or even if you could do isometrics would be a good idea. Yeah, for sure. And then obviously the goal is to get into eccentric and long length isometrics as soon as possible, because like stated in the, the guidelines, like clinicians should use eccentric training to tolerance, um, which is grade A evidence in terms of rehabbing the hamstrings. So making sure that you're getting some type of eccentric training load into the hamstrings as early as possible. And there's a lot of, well, there was one JOSPT article that came out last year that working into painful exercises doesn't inhibit anything. And there's no worse outcomes of working into painful ranges versus non-painful ranges in terms of strengthening and training. It just depends on who you're working with and what stage they are in their rehab process. At what point are you moving them into eccentrics? Um, so I usually start with like glute bridges and then like glute bridge walkouts. I would say mm -hmm. those are probably the least amount of, in terms of like the least aggressive eccentrics, like low level eccentrics. And then going like with um, hamstring curl, like eccentric hamstring curls on a Swiss ball or slide boards, just again, going into their comfortable range. So it might not be that full eccentric. They might have to stop at 15, 20 degrees of um, knee flexion because they just can't handle that long lever, long length eccentric. But usually within the first two weeks, starting to get into like bridge walkouts and things in that nature, but making sure again, they have their adequate active knee extension range of motion first. Um, we did a, we did a podcast a while back on the, one of the exercises was, um, uh, the, the bridge slider. Um, so like you have your, your bridge up and you have your feet, it's kind of like the hamstring curl essentially. Um, and I, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, cause it was a while ago that that was used almost as a, as a, a substitute for the Nordic hamstring curl. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's something that I really, cause Nordics are hard. And if you can, and obviously you're not doing Nordics right away anyway, but if you're doing like walkouts, a progression to that could be a slider. Um, and that could be a nice bridge into a Nordic, or even if someone is not capable of doing a Nordic where they can only get, you know, so far, then I would, you know, have them go into those sliders, whether you start, um, double leg, you could just have them slide out 
come back down and then, you know, just, just do the eccentric portion of the exercise. I think that's a nice transition as well. Yeah, for sure. And a lot of people can tolerate like double leg RDLs pretty early too. You might just give them a dowel or like a light dumbbells and they can just gradually work into that range of motion using lightweight 10, 15 pounds and then gradually add weight and then move into single leg. So, I mean, people can tolerate a lot of those double leg exercises pretty well. It's the, the big thing is getting into that full single leg eccentric, um, strength, which takes a while, especially if people never had it in the first place. For sure. Um, we'll, we'll move on from treatment because I feel like we're going to dive into that later, but, um, uh, return to play. So if we move into that, just in, in, in stage rehab, um, what are you using to, um, give you an idea of when they're ready to return to play? Yeah. So we'll save a lot of this stuff for next week. Cause I want to get into more of that criterion based rehab, but in terms of just general broad, um, characteristics that we want to look at in terms of return to play. So you want to use some type of strength testing. So strength testing at different ranges of hamstring, um, length, um, I like to use the active knee extension range of motion test to be within like 10% limb symmetry index. Um, they need to be able to do certain levels of single leg eccentric exercises. They need to definitely be able to do a Nordic hamstring exercise. And then they need to be able to show me good trunk control in like a single leg. So going back to what we were talking about earlier, um, some things I like for trunk control just like a single leg squat or a single leg heel tap off of like 18 inch bench or box, making sure that there's no like pelvic drop, lateral trunk tilt or lateral trunk um, movement to make sure they can control the hips and pelvis on a single leg. I like that for any type of lower extremity injury. And then just graded um, return to sprinting agility. And if they need to be able to jump double leg, single leg plyometrics. So Again, we'll get into a lot more specific return to play criteria and um, like a criterion based approach next session or next episode. But those are a lot of things that I like to look at broad based. Perfect. Yeah. Um, did we cover everything in the in the guideline at this point? Yeah. So there's grade A evidence of using like the Nordic hamstring exercise or the Nordic hamstring curl. Yeah. So <laughs> the um, using like basically the Nordic hamstring as a part of a larger program that includes appropriate warm up, stretching, stability, tuning, strengthening, and then like you said, functional movements related to the sport. So I feel like it's just like a typical lower extremity um, return to sport or injury prevention um, plan focusing on eccentrics. Yeah. I mean, if you use the FIFA 11 plus, they have Nordic hamstring curls in that program. So that's why the FIFA 11 plus is shown such good results. It kind of hits a little bit of everything hits hamstrings, quads, agility, sprinting, neuromuscular control. So if you're looking for an injury prevention program, definitely check uh, that resource out. I think the last thing um, that you could include into that, they said, um, like, like you said earlier, like nerve glides or slides, um, uh, and you could do that either early or later as like after injury stuff. I don't know if you would add that into your program, but they had that. And that was more of a, um, uh, a level F, um, a recommendation. So more just like a clinician opinion, but, um, something that you could think about adding. Yeah. It's definitely important to assess for that as well. Like some type of neural tension test. Um, I know for me personally, um, having neural tension, and or having a lower back injury in college that kind of set up me having a hamstring issue um, throughout like my sophomore year because I was just told to stretch my hamstrings and never really fix the the true problem of the, like the neural tension so that was something that was kind of just popping up all the time so definitely make sure to check that out in your initial evaluation and evaluating it throughout your program yeah I guess just test it and if it's there treat it um, I think that covers everything. Yeah. So like we were talking about, I definitely want to dive a lot more specific and a lot deeper into like the actual interventions and how to progress these athletes. So we'll, we'll throw a couple papers together and plan on doing that for our next episode.
Yeah, I think also just check out the clinical practice guideline. It's not, it's, some guidelines are huge. This one's not that long. Um, and there's a lot of good information, particularly if you're treating um, athletes or just active population with these injuries. Yeah, it's a really broad based um, paper and it allows you to dive into different sections as much or little as you need. So definitely check it out. Um, do you have any other resources that you like in terms of hamstring, like any go-to people that you look for? Well, uh, Brian Heiderscheid is always a great resource for everything. Um, otherwise, I just kind of, I don't know, I just, I go through, go through the, um, the sources in that guideline. And I think there's a lot of good things in there, um, regardless of, of necessarily who's, who's writing it, but really just looking at the quality of evidence. Yeah. Do you sure. have any? I was going to say Heiderscheid is definitely my go-to. He was the first one I was exposed to. Um, like I said, during residency and kind of just follow him and whatever he's, uh, publishing is definitely good work. So, and like you said, like the papers that we'll dive into are already stated in this CPG. So, um, people have the references for that as well. All right. Uh, we can close this one up, everybody. Thanks for listening. Um, and then we'll, we'll, uh, talk to you next time when we dive more into, tr uh, treatment and return to play with hamstring injuries. All right. Good deal. See you then. See you. Thanks for listening to the Athletes First Performance Podcast. If you have any questions regarding this episode or future episodes, please be sure to reach out on social media or our website. Both links can be found in the show notes.